We're born with it. We're blessed with it. The key to life is using it well. You knew that you made a bad choice. Yes. Choosing a man that was not good for your children. I knew almost immediately. Because of that choice, my older son has suffered quite a bit. The power of choice. Each choice you make can change your life. The people you love, the paths you take, the way you choose to see the world. If you believe that the world is a place where you can experience abundance, then your choices are different than if you were afraid that the world is gonna turn its back on you. You can make choices differently and start to turn your life around. When you choose to respond to life's difficulties with compassion and love, you create a heaven on earth. How can something so simple be so powerful? Gary Zukov will show you how next. Gary Zukov is back, author of my favorite book, The Seat of the Soul. And after he was here a few months ago, hundreds of thousands of you bought his book and wrote to us about how it changed your life. Thank you so much. You can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> One of the central ideas in Gary's book is, we'll sit down too, is the chapter on choice. Uh, the book is divided, as you know, those of you who've read it, over a million of you already, uh, it's divided into different sections, intention, uh, reverence, choice, he says, is uh, every choice that we make has an effect on our lives. And everybody's with me on that so far, right? You believe that? Every <coughs> choice you make has an effect on your life. And how you choose to deal with struggles determines the kind of life that we have. The question we're asking today is whether or not you believe your struggles are caused by the choices you have made, or do you think you suffer because of what other people choose to do to you? This is one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. Uh, because you have the power, I know this to be true, to change the direction your life is going by making choices that are different. Isn't that true, Gary? That is absolutely true. <laughs> Intention is the basic choice that you make. That is the fundamental choice. Mm -hmm. And it's the intention that you choose that creates the consequences. What do you say, though, for all the people who are watching right now already saying, oh, for goodness sakes, how, what about, you know, <coughs> tragedies? Um, earthquakes, tornadoes, things that seem to happen to people that they have no choice about whatsoever. You always have the choice of how to respond. No one can take that choice from you. You always choose how you will respond to what you encounter in your life. And what you choose determines what you will encounter in the future. You speak in the book many times about responsible choice, because lots of people make choices. And so the idea of an authentically empowered person is to be able to make responsible choices. And what is a responsible choice, in your opinion? In my opinion, a responsible choice is a choice for which the cho that creates consequences for which the chooser is willing to assume responsibility. And most people think, Oprah, that the major choices that they make in their life are choices such as a partner or a job or whether to have children. Mm -hmm. And I want to suggest to you and to the people who are listening to us that the choices that we make deep inside about who we are and what the universe is are choices that are creating consequences moment by moment by moment. Uh -huh. If you feel, for example, if you have made the choice that you are not a powerful person, that you cannot impact the world around you, if you have made another choice that the universe is uncaring or cruel or vindictive or not to be trusted, and you put those two choices together, do you see how... Or that you can't get ahead because you're black, or that you can't get ahead yes. because you're poor, or that you can't get ahead because you're a woman, or can't get ahead because you live in a certain region. If that is what you inherently, unconsciously believe, then that is what will be the consequence in your life. Precisely. So you're saying that the choices we make about how we view the world and our relationship to the world are really the biggest choices ever made. More important than even than your spouse or whether you have children or choose this job or that job. Much more important because those are the choices that will determine what kind of person you will partner with, hmm. how you will use your life energy, mm -hmm. 
how you will relate to children if you choose to have them. Okay, y'all following us? Okay, when you're not, just raise your hand. <laughs> Gary will explain. Okay, one way to see how each choice in your life has led you to where you are is to think of your life as a roadmap of choices. We asked Gary to map out some of the choices he's made. And I think this is very important, for example, for a lot of people who are still very angry and you think that life has dealt you an unfair consideration, you can roadmap and backtrack in your life and see, uh, as an example, how you got to where you are right now based upon choices, conscious and unconscious, some responsible, some not. Well, Gary did the same thing and found that some of his early life choices were based on anger, addiction, and fear. You, Gary. Yes, I. <laughs> Take a look at how he turned his life around. Back. Early on, Gary's choices were driven by the anger and the emptiness that consumed him. For years, I felt resentful, jealous, bitter, uh, and very judgmental. I was so angry that I joined the Green Berets, and I did that because I felt so inadequate. I needed my uniform to make me feel worthy, and I was so angry that I wanted to kill. And I went to Vietnam looking for that, but I wasn't aware of the full range of what I was feeling. I didn't know that I was afraid to reach out to other people. I wasn't aware of any of those fears, and those were the fears that were driving the choices that I was making. As a young man, Gary says every choice he made was for personal gain and control over others. I was addicted. Now, my addiction wasn't to alcohol. My addiction was to sex. I would look for weaker, susceptible, seducible souls. Everything was a scam for me. And that's the way my world was until something magical happened. I discovered quantum physics. It always produces the most meaningful conversations about the deepest philosophical questions possible. He went on to write The Dancing Wooly Masters, which won the American Book Award and rave reviews. It also marked the first time in his life Gary made the choice to give back to the world. And it changed my life. The power of a choice to give, to give a gift to share what was so exciting to me. Ultimately, it was the study of the physical world that led Gary to explore the non-physical world. I discovered that the universe is alive, that it's compassionate, that there's more to this world than I can see or hear or touch. Choosing to write his second book, The Seat of the Soul, changed his life and thousands of others. Now, Gary was making choices based on love and forgiveness. One of the choices that changed my life is my decision to heal my relationship with my father. I spent most of my life angry at him. And that was a choice I was making for myself. I couldn't imagine at the time how much I would come to love him. Gary says that one of the strongest choices he made was to open up his heart to his spiritual partner, Linda. I did not decide to do this because I wanted something from Linda, because I felt emotionally needy. I did it because I wanted to give. And now I am making my choices as often as I can to create the joy and the exhilaration and the fulfillment. Could you see when you were in the anger? I mean, for you to say that you joined the Green Beret because you wanted the right to kill legally, and could you see that at the time? Yes, I could see that, but there was so much that I couldn't see. For example, I couldn't see how frightened I was. I needed to see myself as someone who was fearless or someone who was brave enough to jump out of an airplane even when I was frightened and even brave enough to say, I'm frightened to jump out of this airplane. But I couldn't see how frightened I was not to live up to my own expectations. If I had known how frightened I was to love and how terrified I was to be loved, how terrifying it is to think that somebody, to open myself and think that I might be used, I could have gone to work on that. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to prove that I'm a man by wearing a beret, carrying a, a weapon and jumping out of airplanes. I'm so grateful that I, I did not kill a brother in Vietnam. I tried, but the universe was very kind. Kind to you. Kind to me. Mm -hmm. Coming up. 
This mom says she made so many bad choices that she lost her home and put her children at risk. And now she fears making any decision at all. When we come back, how she can make responsible choices without fear. Thank you, Gary. Um, we're talking with Gary Zukov, author of The Seat of the Soul, about how to get authentic power, which is another one of the chapters in the book that I love so much, um, and the life you want by making responsible choices. This is Jane, who says that she lost her home and she put her children at risk because she made so many bad choices. And now Jane's afraid to make any choice at all. Take a look. I've been traveling down a really rough road and I'm now at the lowest point of my life because I've made so many bad choices. Since my husband died six years ago, I spent all of the $150,000 we received in life insurance on things I couldn't afford. I wanted to show people I was doing well, but that choice put me on the road to financial ruin. I also chose to get into a relationship with a man who I knew wasn't good for my children. And although it hurts me to know my boys suffered because of that choice, I am now tempted to go down that road again and let him back into our lives because I am so lonely. It seems like when things begin to go well, I choose the road that brings turmoil into my life. It's a pattern that started when I was growing up surrounded by chaos with a violent, alcoholic father. Now I am not making any choices at all because I am so afraid of making another bad one. I feel numb, powerless, and I desperately want to know how to make responsible choices. Thank you for sharing that, Liz. You're welcome. Yes. You said you are tempted. You knew that you made a bad choice. Yes. Choosing a man that was not good for your children. Right. I knew almost immediately. Why did you do that? I was very lonely, and I just needed somebody to be there for me. I wasn't thinking of my children, and it wasn't until the relationship had evolved uh, somewhat that I realized it was just not going to work. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't give him up, and because of that choice, my older son has suffered quite a bit yeah. emotionally. Yeah. I wanted to, and now you're saying that you're tempted to go down that road again. Yes. Because of your own loneliness and fear. Right. I, I don't like being alone, and I do love this man. I love him. Mm. Even though I, he's bad for your children. Even though he's, he's, yes, even though he's bad for my children, but I keep thinking, well, with counseling mm. or with prayer or with... You know, I'm mm -hmm. trying to I'm trying to find a way where it, it's okay that I can do this again. Which is very interesting, I think. And that's why it's so brave of you, I think, to share this, because everybody's mumbling, but we know there are many people out there who are also in this same position. And understanding that the consequences of a choice that you make today, you just said your older son is suffering emotionally, will lead not just to your son's generation, but will be passed on to their children also. That's how... That's, that's how heavy this choice is. I know. Uh, it, it's huge, and I shouldn't even be considering it. And I, but my heart is telling me one thing. My heart is telling me that I want this person. Um, my soul is telling me something different. Um, is it your heart telling you or your fear telling you that you can't do any better? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I like asking good ones. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Maybe Gary can answer that one. Um, probably a fear of being alone. It's scary. It, it's hard to raise children alone. But I think it is more love. I really do. It's a, it's a strong emotion. And I love my children. And, and in spite of everything, I just can't seem to just sever it completely. Jane says she's numb to her feelings. And Gary says that is why she is unable to make responsible choices. Take a look at what happened when Gary and Jane met just a few days ago. I think the hardest emotion to get past is anger. I felt when my husband passed away, God took the wrong person. It, it should have been me. He wasn't irresponsible. He thought things out. And as I go on making decisions that cause more and more chaos for my boys, 
I get more angry because I say, God, if you had taken me, none of this would be happening. Blaming the universe is a way of avoiding your own responsibility. It's a choice and it will only create pain. Can you entertain the possibility that the right parent lived? Your husband died. Now you can say, I am a victim. Or you can say, I am a student, and there are things to learn from this. That's a choice. A choice of the way that you look at your experiences and yourself. Tell me about your feeling of being numb. Anger, I think, is kind of numbing. For me, the angrier I get, it makes it impossible for me to feel anything else. And so sometimes anger is good because it blocks out all the other feelings that I might be having. Anything that blocks your feelings is not constructive for you. It's always necessary to feel, to feel everything that you're feeling. Until you do, you will continue to create mm -hmm. the same consequences again and again. It's all a matter of choice. What else did you want to say, Gary? Every personality is a complex configuration. You have parts of yourself, many parts of yourself, and each part of yourself has different goals, different agendas, different orientations. And they're at odds with each other often. For example, you go to sit down in a restaurant, part of you wants to eat healthy, the other part wants the cheesecake. And this continues. Now the question is, what shall you choose? If there are parts of your personality that you're not aware of, they will do the choosing for you. And the only way that you can find those parts of your personality that are operating outside your field of awareness is to become aware of everything that you are feeling because your feelings will bring you to those parts of yourself. Okay, also not to choose is a choice. Correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is a very definite choice. Because you think by kind of being in limbo that you're not choosing, but you are. Right. I, I'm sitting back and, and letting fate decide because then I don't have to take responsibility. I can say, well, I didn't choose that, it just happened. So it's almost like taking a vacation from responsibility where I just wait to see what's gonna happen. But you're always gonna be held accountable. I know. You can't avoid it. I know, I know. This is what is so interesting to me. See if you all find it the same, uh, what Gary writes about temptation. This mm -hmm. is very interesting for a lot of people who are tempted in a lot of different ways. Temptation is the universe's compassionate way of allowing you to run through what would be a harmful, negative, karmic dynamic if you were to allow it to become physically manifest. Mm -hmm. It is the energy through which your soul is given the gracious opportunity to have a dry run at a life lesson, mm -hmm. at a situation that if you can see clearly, can be removed and heal within the confines of your own private world of energy and not spill into a larger energy field of other souls. Mm -hmm. Temptation is a dress rehearsal for a karmic experience of negativity. So you're being tempted. When you say you're being tempted to go down that road again, mm -hmm. it's a dress rehearsal <laughs> for a karmic experience of, of negativity. But isn't that an interesting way to look at temptation? Not to be afraid of the temptation, to, to actually embrace it and yes. allow yourself to work through it. If you don't embrace it and you don't work through it, you'll live it, you'll act it out. That's what I mean when I say that if you're not aware of all of the parts of your personality, mm -hmm. those that you're not aware of will make your choices for you. They will become your obsessions, fixations, and addictions. How do you become aware of all the parts of your personality? How do you start that? You start by becoming aware of everything that you're feeling. Now, if you think that you're not feeling anything, try this simple exercise. Get a, a small notebook, this big by this big, with a spiral binding at the top. Carry it with you, and every few minutes, or whenever you remember, ask yourself, what am I feeling? And write it down. And if you don't feel you're feeling anything, write that down, but keep asking. And eventually, you'll start to find that you are feeling things. And as you begin this process of asking yourself what you're feeling, you sensitize yourself to what you're feeling because you are feeling. And until you can get in touch with what you're feeling, 
You can't grow spiritually. You can't go anywhere. Emotions are the force field of your soul. You also say, and see this is so, that each time you are challenged with anger or, because you were saying the anger is so all-consuming mm -hmm. sometimes, it's made you numb, anger or fear or jealousy or whatever, it's an opportunity for you to challenge that in a way and empower yes. yourself. Yes, yes, not in a way. That's exactly right. May I ask you this? What is it that you are so afraid of? It, the part that scares me is getting myself up going out the door and trying to live life, trying to start life, trying to jump start, trying to move forward. That's the part that scares me, is the unknown. Which takes us back to the very first thing you were saying at the beginning of the show, that the choices that you make that will be the most important is how you view yourself in relationship to the world. If you believe that the world is ultimately going to be a place where you can experience abundance, where you're gonna have all the love that you need, or you're going to be fulfilled in your being, then your choices are different than if you were afraid that the world is going to turn its back on you. Isn't that, isn't that what you were saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fundamental. That's a fundamental choice. And I believe that. And I wish I could have those feelings that, the, that there's abundance out there and that there's joy and that there's... But you don't. I, honestly, no. Mm -hmm. It's not in my heart. I Let's talk about that then, Gary, when we come back. If that is the fundamental question, how you view yourself in relationship to the world, how then do you begin to change that if you don't believe that the world is a giving, abundant, and joyful place? I'll give you some time to think about that. We'll be right back. You say fundamentally the, the big question is how you view yourself in the world because that then determines how you react with your children, how you react with your job, whether or not you think the world is a safe and giving place and you can be successful no matter what you do. That's true. And you can be safe and giving. Right, no matter how, what happens. That's right, how can you be safe and giving if you feel the universe is vindictive, cruel, judgmental, and ready to pounce and on you? And doesn't like me. That's right. That's right, and I think a lot of people feel that the world just doesn't like them. Mm -hmm. Now. If you, you may not to be, that, be to that extreme, but you were saying you don't believe that the universe is an abundant, joyful, giving place. Not so far. Um, and how old are you? You want to tell 43. us? 43. Well, it's about time to figure that out. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> okay, so the question I was asking before the break is, if you don't think that, and obviously there are lots of people who are mm -hmm. there, how do you begin to change that? How do you begin to see that it's different? Listen to what we're saying on this show. Listen to what we are saying on this show. As long as you believe that the world is cruel, you will live in a cruel world. As long as you believe that the world is taking, you will live in a taking world. The world of your experience will always validate your beliefs. Understand this clearly. The world of your experience will always validate your beliefs. If you wait, for someone to prove to you, for me, for Oprah, for anyone to prove to you that this is a loving world, but you don't believe it, you will never find that loving world. It starts with you, with the decisions that you make, with the intention that you hold. We are talking now about the basic issue of how to become an authentically empowered human, how to be whole and inwardly secure, how to give the gifts that you came onto this earth to give, and you cannot give it waiting for someone to tell you or to convince you or to show you that this world and this universe is loving and compassionate. Gary says that to make responsible choices, you have to ask yourself a few key questions. The first is, what will this choice produce? Since we have you right here, let's just talk to you about that. Okay. What will this choice produce? Let's say going back with this gentleman. It could go either way. It could be that he and I have been down the road, maybe he's learned lessons, and maybe things could be better as far as he and I and my children, or it could be the way that it was. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm trying to be, I don't know if the word's optimistic, but I'd like to think that if I did... Are you willing to accept the consequences of making the choice, though? I always accept the consequences for my choices. Like I, if your children are emotionally disturbed and need psychiatric help as a result of the choice, you are willing to accept that consequence? 
I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I. It depends on who how should I we look ask. At it. No, but who should we ask other than you? Am I ready to accept the consequences? No. I'm. I, I would be if they turned out well. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. Honest. You're great. That's great. Okay, that's the, isn't that the whole point? Are you willing to accept the consequences if they turn out well or they don't? Isn't that the whole point? That is the point. And I would like to make sure that everyone here and watching us understands that our job is not to make a judgment. I feel my job is not to make a judgment about how Jane or Oprah or anyone else makes what choices you make, but simply to say, I suggest that you consider the possibility that you are creating powerfully with each choice and that you look at that possibility because if you do, you will start making your choices more consciously as you realize that you are going to experience the consequences of them. This is at the very heart of spiritual growth. And that is how you make a responsible choice by asking, am I ready to accept yes. the consequences, mm -hmm. whatever they might be? Right. Okay. Coming up, this couple made choices in their marriage based on fear, jealousy, and anger. When we come back, find out why Gary says that's the real reason they feel empty and unfulfilled. Back in a moment. talking with Gary Zukov, who's the best-selling author of The Seat of the Soul. And Gary says every choice we make, there's a whole chapter on responsible choice and temptation and what that means in our lives, brings us closer or farther away from our souls. This is Cindy and Ron. Cindy feels she has started to make responsible choices that have brought her closer to her own soul, but says they've also taken her further away from her husband, Ron. Take a look. My husband and I have been married for 25 years and have never had a spiritual relationship. We've never talked about the deeper issues that threaten to end our marriage. I feel empty and alone. My marriage leaves me feeling unfulfilled. Our relationship is a bumpy road because we've made irresponsible choices over the past years based on fear, jealousy, and anger. I always feared being alone. My father was emotionally absent all my life, and I looked for a father figure to protect me and make me feel safe. Ron was a doctor and met my needs physically and financially, but not spiritually. Most of my choices were to achieve power and control. Sometimes, when I felt bad about myself, I would have an affair, never thinking of the consequences. I chose only to think of myself. When I found out my husband had been unfaithful, I chose to react jealous and angry and had an affair of my own. This only made me feel more empty and less powerful. I feel the distance between Cindy and me, and I don't want to lose her. I want to learn to make healthier choices, or I risk losing myself and my marriage. There you have it. What do you want to say? A marriage that does not have in it spiritual partnership, the energy of equals who know that they are together as souls and that the reason that they are together is to grow spiritually does not have a future. Gary says Cindy and Ron are empty and unfulfilled because their choices have been based on fear and jealousy and anger. Would you agree with that, Ron? I would. I, I, I felt through the years that I've been very reactionary. I had I had success in my, in my profession, but I kept feeling like that there was some emptiness inside that I needed to fill external, from an external action. So therefore I went outside the marriage to try and solve those issues. To make yourself feel more powerful? Or, or better, uh -huh. or better internally about myself. That's what I mean, powerful, yes, right, better. Yes, yeah. right, yeah. Which is so interesting, Ron, this point that you make as a doctor is that Gary speaks to this too in that wonderful chapter on what real power is that you might have if, if you for many people if your beauty is what you use as your sense of getting through the world in power or if it's money or if it's you know having a nice home or having nice things eventually you, all of those things either go away or become meaningless in your life because you can have all the things in the world but if you don't believe that you are enough none of those things will That's ever right. be enough. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the truth? Exactly. Yeah. That's wrong. Exactly. External power is reaching outward to rearrange the world to fill an emptiness 
inside. It's actually a terror inside. Yes, it's a terror. And authentic power begins with looking inward to fill the hole. And that's something that only you can do. A lot of times people try to fight within their own marriages to remain monogamous or to, you know, not go outside the marriage and then lose that battle because... Well, because th there are many reasons. Uh, but one of them is that they're not sharing with each other the things that are most frightening to share. Spiritual partners know that if they do not discuss with each other what is most frightening to discuss, it's bearing dynamite. Because you can suppress it and suppress it and suppress it, but it's still there. It's still there, and it's going to explode. What did you want to say, Cindy? Well, we didn't discuss anything. We were, um, we were totally external power. Um, and we, we didn't get into any deep um, emotional stuff. So over the years, uh, we were growing further and further apart. And I felt it in here, and I felt it in here. But I dealt with it physically. My by, personality. By what? By, uh, I retaliated. I retaliated. I was angry. I was fearful. Um, I wanted to, um, I, I left. I drove from Louisiana to Idaho and back in one weekend. Ooh. And I realized <laughs> that I, the person I was really running from was right here, mm -hmm. was right with me in the car, and I couldn't get away from that. And um, so I finally came to, um, the point that I realized that the hole was here and I was trying to fill it from outside mm -hmm. and I needed mm -hmm. to fill it from inside out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read Gary's book and it gave me, oh, it just empowered me, it gave me words to explain to Ronnie what I had been feeling all these years. I've really started making choices about myself from the inside. And I've shared this with Ronnie and and hope that he will um, choose to do whatever work he needs to if he feels he needs to. And then where we go from here um, remains to be seen. I don't have a crystal ball, I can't predict that, but I can know now that I have choices that are going to come from within, and I know now how to not uh, project, but think about the consequences of my choices, which I never did in the past. I just reacted instead of following what was in here. Thank you. Coming up, how a devastating tragedy brought this mother face to face with the ultimate choice. We'll be right back. Okay, pay attention to this, if you will. This is Teresa, and last summer, her ex-husband chose the cruelest act of revenge by killing their three children and leaving her to live with that nightmare for the rest of her life. Now, how she chose to react to that tragedy uh, is the ultimate story of the power of choice. Take a look. John and I were married close to six years. We had two children together, first a boy and then a girl. And then I had one son from a prior marriage. Over the last couple of years, things really started to deteriorate in the marriage. He could not communicate anything with me. Over time, it destroyed our marriage. One day last July of 98, I was just recently divorced from my husband by days and he broke into the house one morning. He killed both of his children and then his stepson, my oldest son, and then he turned the gun on himself and killed himself. His whole objective was to leave me alive, to live a life of hell on earth. From the time of the tragedy, my original feeling was emptiness. My children were gone, everything was gone. And then it went to an anger. I was very angry and I hated John and everything he did. After the first of the year, I started seeing a therapist. She suggested that I read the book, The Seed of the Soul, and that was one of the best things that I did since the tragedy. When you choose to respond to life's difficulties with compassion and love, instead of fear and doubt, you create a heaven on earth. I will not give in to John's wishes to live a hell on earth. 
I will do everything to make the rest of my life as much of a heaven on earth as I can. I have two photo albums that are filled. I look through those pictures and sometimes the emotion, I just cry and I cry and I cry. And, um, but I know it's healing, I know it's good. I can look at them sometimes and not cry and just remember the great feelings that I have of remembering my children. Another way I will remember my children is I'm taking a lot of their clothes that I kept from the time they were babies and I'm going to make a quilt. The tragedy last summer made the winter so long, but now it's spring and the birds sing a song. I have written a poem about that morning, about the nightmare, about each of my children trying to recapture the way they were before they died. It's a release of emotion for me to be able to put it into words. Being angry made me realize that I knew it was going to destroy my life, so that in turn made me make a responsible choice not to give in to that anger and that hatred, but to go on with my life. And then I fell in love with my fiance. We would go down to the river and lay on a blanket and read the seat of the soul. Can you choose consciously to cultivate? We have just grown so close and very spiritually together. I'm making a choice to go on with my life and to try to make it as full and as happy as I can. And I know as time goes by, greater things will happen. That is the ultimate. Is that not the ultimate? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. How were you able to do that? I just, I won't let John win. When he came in the house, he said, I'm here to take back my kids and my home. He did that as well as take away my job, my life, my existence. And I just, I know if I give in to that, I will destroy myself, he will win, he will destroy me, he'll take over me, and then he will win, and I refuse to allow that. If not just for me, then for my children, I will not allow that to happen. Bravo, D. Whoa. We'll be right back. I was saying during the commercial break that the fact that you could make t to choose, and it is a conscious choice, not to succumb to the darkness of that, the evil and darkness of that, is uh, remarkable. But you were saying, which I think is important for other people to hear, that it was there for a while because you're not a right. saint. You did feel it and had to ch choose to make. In the beginning, immediately after the tragedy, the first thing I felt was emptiness, as I said. From there, it went to hatred. I had so much hatred and anger, and I didn't know what to do with it. I would talk to my friends who were putting together collages of my children to put on display at the funeral home, and any picture that had John in it was immediately put aside, and I just wanted them destroyed and his face cut out, and then just keep the pictures of my children, because they're irreplaceable. And after we destroyed all of those, um, by talking to friends, the only thing I could think about was taking a bouquet of black balloons and go to his grave and spit on it. And that's all I wanted to do, just as a release. My personality told me to do that, but my soul told me I can't do that because then I am going to potentially harm his family and especially his mother. And I could not cause more grief for her because I wouldn't even want to be in her shoes either. Mm -hmm. And so I decided not to do anything such as that. But within a week after the tragedy, I had to go back into my house to sort what was left of my belongings. And when I went down into the basement where John killed himself, the carpet area where he was was ripped and torn out. So when I went in there with a friend and for my own emotional cleansing, I guess, and just to get rid of all of the anger, I could just scream and spit on the floor in my house, the last place he laid, and I don't know if I got rid of it all then, but he answers to a higher authority, much, much higher than me, and I'm not about to try to judge or worry about Live your about. life in revenge of that. Right, and I can't do that. It's remarkable. We'll be, what do you want to say? I, I'm, I'm grateful that my life has brought me into contact with you, and I'm grateful to be in the presence of a great soul. Thank you.
Why do you say she's a great soul? Because everyone in this studio is a great soul, and everyone watching us is a great soul. But this is a soul who has touched the power of who she is. Don't think that you, wherever you are, have any less power or any less nobility. Thank you. Or clarity or right to be on the earth and to be happy and living in a world of love and forgiveness and generosity and fulfillment and joy. And I want to experience the rest of that. <laughs> we'll be right back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks again to Gary Zukov. The name of Gary's book is The Seed of the Soul. It has affected millions of people's lives, and uh, we hope millions more. Thank you. We'll see you again in the fall. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs>